So you have a small team. Mm -hmm. I'm sure very capable, hyper capable people. You have a small team within the, say, scope of, let's just call it climate solutions or technologies that have, that are both attractive in and of their own right for various reasons, but have some, let's just call it beneficial impact on the circumstances we find ourselves in. How do you apply constraints to that? So you have positive constraints that you've applied elsewhere in the company in terms of total headcount and uh, various other ways that you've applied constraints. How do you choose your targets and make sure that you have a, a focus? How do you eliminate things? Well, first is it's a wide funnel. So it really is based on, do they have a cool mission? Are we curious about the technology? Is this something that's important? Is this a really big market or a really big problem that is solving something for, let's say, the climate crisis? And it could be anything. So it's not just materials or just petrochemicals or carbon capture. We look across everything. So mm -hmm. because frankly, at the end of the day, the reason why we do this is because we love to learn and you got to really understand the systems thinking as opposed to just one thing if you're really going to solve the problems we have. So we like to look broad, very broad, mm -hmm. both from a technology perspective, value change perspective, as well as regional perspective or country based. So we look at mm -hmm. all this and that's just how many cycles we have to learn and how many people bring us interesting ideas. So that's kind of the top of the funnel. But as we narrow down, there's a few things. One is, can this be deployed en masse in the next 10 years? And is it going to be disruptive? Is it going to be like we talked about that, the switch, you know, that from the, the vacuum tube right. to the transistor, but this electrical distribution mem switch. It is, can be applied to so many things along the way. And it's so disruptive. We're like, that needs to exist. When it's disruptive and not just evolutionary, but it's going to change the players on top. It's going to change the products fundamentally. It's going to bring a win-win-win for the environment as well and customers as well as the, the manufacturers. That's when we see big gains. Like we were talking about the motors as well. Mm -hmm. So we want something with disruptive, wide impact because that's what it's going to take to help fix this planet. We can't just have little, there's no silver bullet for this. We've created so many different systems over the last 150 years. Most of them, almost all of them, have even been thought about in a circular fashion, you know, and how to get the trash or how to make it more efficient. It's just like, oh, it works. But it works for that business, not for the planet, for us as a society. So those are the kind of things that we really look to. And that's how we narrow that funnel. So that's the first thing is, does the technology, is it disruptive? Is it close to being marketable? You know, is it close to being a product? The third thing is, and this is one of the most important things that we've learned across all of our portfolios, is there a way that we can quickly scale? So because we have to, we have to reboot the planet. This is not just, yeah. oh, we got to go do one industry in this one state or some in this country. We're talking about when we say plastic problem, it's around the world. When we talk about energy and efficiency, it's around the world. So if you have something, we want to see the disruptive technology. That it's it meets it's it's it meets a lot of needs and can be out of the lab and into people's lives within ten years in a mass scale. And do you have the technology for scale? In other words, a lot of times when we see, well, we don't want to just hear about your one factory. What is your scale plan for making a hundred of these factories so we can right. quickly deploy them around the world? Right? How can we get this stuff moved quickly? To, to every corner of the planet because we all have these problems. So I think those are the three fundamental things that helped us to narrow that funnel down. And then there's obviously the financial terms and if we can help and, you know, all the other stuff. But the big, the broad strokes are really those three things. All right. So I'm going to dig, dig a little deeper on this. And I just want to mention briefly, and I can never pronounce his last name. Maybe you can, maybe you can get it right. But rather than butcher it, Shamath, most people know who I'm talking about when I say Chamath. Sure, Chamath, yeah. Has said, you know, the first trillionaire in the world is someone who's going to fix climate change or greatly contribute to, to climate change. Uh, so there's a lot of there. I do think having just watched kind of the sea change in the last few years, there's there's some really some tremendous, tremendous opportunities for for just let's just call it cold blooded capitalists who want a great return on investment. Uh, sure. There there are there are many technologies and solutions being developed now that that 
if we're talking about direct to consumer or products that consumers use, that consumers will choose over alternatives. So I think it's become really exciting on the playing field. You mentioned now there are certain things that I would say are seem obvious and get discussed a lot. So let's just say adoption of solar, maybe subsidies from the government such that we have less dependence on on fossil fuels and foreign, especially uh, foreign energy. But I had never realized, as you described, that so much energy was lost just due to inefficiencies from point A to sort of point Z. What are some of the uncrowded or underestimated targets, let's just say, or areas related to climate change that you you think people should pay more attention to? There is what you can do personally, and there's what it can be done professionally. And if we look at, you know, obviously there's EVs and doing the right thing there and doing the your recycling and composting and all the right stuff at home and not, you know, reuse, don't buy all new. So there's all those kinds of consumer facing things that need to happen. Yeah. But it's really incumbent on the innovators, the companies, the individuals in the world to bring new solutions to consumers or change out the system without the customers even knowing. Yeah. To make things more efficient because customers don't know that 60% of all the energy created in the world's lost. What can they do about it? It just shows up. So we have to go and reboot our infrastructure in some ways. And so in many ways, in almost every way. And so there's one for me that we're now finally getting into, which is the hydrogen economy. So if we think about all these different chemicals that we use today are come out of pet petroleum, okay? Mm -hmm. They come out from sucking something out of the ground and then refining it, what have you. Plastics is one of that. We can move to hydrogen-based economy to create all of those products. We can create them more quickly with no or little CO2, get the similar products out, and they're actually more profitable to be made for the companies themselves. So there's all of these things around hydrogen, like let's give you fertilizer. Okay, doesn't sound sexy, but we need a lot of fertilizer in this world. Now there's other ways of tackling that too, but fertilizer is a huge one. Concrete is another one. Concrete's huge, yeah. Steel, another one, right? Thermal, just creating thermal, you know, thermals like high temperature steam and those kinds of things for different industrial processes. Today, we burn coal, natural gas or whatever. We could do it with hydrogen or we can do it with electricity, right? That whole area see, is unloved. People are starting to work on it. They're starting to make starting to make inroads there. But we need a lot more work on those things. It's not just electric cars. It's not just the things that you hear about in the in the press every day. So I think that we need to be really thinking about the hydrogen economy and to a certain extent, the biomass economy, because we can actually turn a lot of the, the things we use today, like let's say jet fuel, those can come from bio sources, trash sources, not edible sources, but really trash or waste and turn those into things that can stay carbon neutral. It's not a perfect solution because we're using things on the on the ground in the on the planet right biomass but it's just sitting there and it's going to turn into you know co2 or methane so we could put it back in and use those things now and we have lots of technologies to do that so i think hydrogen economy biomass economy not chopping down trees and just lighting up smoke that's not what i'm talking about here i'm saying transforming it into chemicals and raw materials so that they can be used not just burning wood you know which we see a lot of people fudging that they say that's clean energy it's not 